In the first two modules of this series, we identified several fundamental questions that need to be addressed when making strategic use of the courts to enforce the right to education. We evaluated the risks and potential benefits of litigation as one of several avenues for holding the government and private providers of education to account. We unpacked the preliminary decisions that public interest litigators, civil society organisations and clients need to make during the early stages of litigation to ensure they build a strong case in court. However, to ensure that a legal victory has meaningful impact beyond the courtroom, careful consideration needs to be given to crafting effective remedies and meaningful follow-up measures. The third module in this series explores the main factors that shape remedial strategy in litigating the right to education. An important aspect of strategic decision making in this regard is to consider what forms of relief a court might be willing to grant or approve. Some forms of relief might be low-hanging fruit that a litigator can be confident a court would readily grant. While it might be harder to convince a court that more ambitious relief is required to give meaningful effect to rights. Strategic lawyering also requires the development of novel, creative remedies to meet the unique challenges posed by a case. We begin this module by learning about how litigators formulate their remedial strategy. both um, and formulating strategy is actually one of the most important and crucial aspects of the litigation. Um, sometimes we just go for low-hanging fruit if we want to test the waters, uh, but we're often, uh, if we are confident of the court and of our claim, we are often more ambitious. And in some cases, we try both strategies. We ask for some easy, simple reliefs, and we also seek more ambitious, uh, larger structural relief. Uh, um, because we don't know which way the court is going to go. So, for example, in one of our cases where we had challenged uh, the minority uh, rules, uh, we challenged the constitutional validity of minority rules, we asked, we not only challenged uh, the rules, which uh, was actually quite difficult in the current context in Karnataka, but we also sought for implementation of norms and standards in minority schools. And as it turned out, while the court did not interfere with uh, the minority rules uh, on the ground that it is a policy matter, uh, the court was actually very uh, open and, uh, and gave an order, a declaratory order directing that all schools, even if they were minority schools, still had to comply with norms and standards. And uh, so we tried both and we at least got one relief. education on scholar transport in the province of KwaZulu-Natal and this is a case that will particularly affect um, scholar transport provision for learners in um, rural areas in, in that province and um, in, in recognizing the problems uh, of planning and budgeting uh, which are affecting the adequate provision of scholar transport in that province uh, one of the key things that equal education um, is trying to get out of that case is to ensure that government is properly thinking about planning for scholar transport. And so in the relief, one of the things we're requesting is for the court to actually have the government officials report to the court on what their plans are going to be. 
and from there, Equal Education will be able to then utilize the reports that the government officials provide to the court to hold the, the, the state to account. I suppose that designing the remedy is really important in terms of what is the relief that you're asking for, how it can be implemented, and how you can monitor its implementation. So it's sort of three different aspects of it. And it's quite hard to think about that all the time and to keep the focus. So generally, when you are pulling these cases together, it's a lot of work to get the information. It's a lot of work to put the information, to package the information. And then when you start thinking about your notice of motion in where you set out your remedy, it's really easy to forget an essential step. Because the essential steps are so obvious that you you almost it's just unbelievably easy to forget to put it in because you because of the problems that we have in enforcing the results the 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 relief that we're seeking has become so detailed that it's almost like you have to say it's like teaching a child to walk pick up your foot put it in front of you and then pick up the other foot and then put that one in front of you and then be careful that you don't trip. So it's so obvious because we all know how to walk that you it's very hard to, to put in every single step. It's very fact dependent, it's very case dependent. Uh, sometimes it makes sense to go for a building blocks approach. Um, at other times, reaching high might uh, be the best way to ensure that you achieve what it is you're actually seeking to achieve. Well, I the trust was in the, the well, so many capacities, but one of them is being former Chief Justice of South Africa. But after he left the bench, back to the LRC and sort of helped us think through the cases. But he used to say that remedy is the first thing to think about because if you if you can't uh, locate your case within a remedial framework, then you shouldn't be it at all. So in that sense, uh, although remedy looks like it appears uh, last, it actually should be at the front and center of your strategic thinking. It's precisely what remedy you want because it's pointless to institute a case is remediless. And there's a judgment by the Supreme Court of Appeal, I think it was Judge Cameron who said something about the courts speak through their remedies. So it seems actually that it should be the first thing to think about. Yes, I think also another thing that does happen is that cases begin to take shape as they go on. So you may start off with a certain remedial outcome that you want, um, but you probably need a degree of flexibility so that as you go on, if you can see that one particular remedy won't work, you can shift. We usually consider remedies right in the beginning, um, and in fact, uh, it's keeping the remedies in mind that the entire litigation is uh, strategized or framed. So we usually work with organizations who are going to be petitioners to really uh, think of remedies and uh, you know plan the remedies first uh, uh, when we plan our litigation and the whole litigation is built around that and at the time of planning remedies we you know, we think of what is really needed, uh, uh, but also what kind of orders are possible from the court. Um, if orders are possible, how will they be implemented? So we look at all these factors in mind when we plan the remedy uh, uh, in, in, right in the beginning. I think that traditionally, uh, as public interest lawyers, we think remedy first in a sense that we decide what issue it is that we'd like to pursue. Uh, we do our necessary due diligence in terms of the legal and factual position on the issue, um, at, which to, at which point we all sort of put our heads together and um, decide on remedy. Uh, but this is not necessarily the case and sometimes uh, a remedy can come uh, after a court case has uh, crossed your desk and sort of taken hold of you and things have just speed ahead. The uh, 
remedies that we seek um, are central to you know what is our substantive claim and uh, we we frame our remedies in a way that we get uh, our substantive claim granted um, so for example in in our case on minority schools our central aim really was to ensure that norms and standards are implemented in all schools um, of course you know, we were also affected by the fact that guidelines for minority schools were unclear. But our fundamental substantive claim was to ensure that norms and standards are implemented uh, in all schools. And the fact that we had uh, we had a specific remedy to uh, seek this relief as well helped because it, we ultimately uh, it uh, got us our substantive claim. Mm-hmm.